Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I had a whole bunch of people send me the story out of North Carolina because it hits several of the things that we talk about all the time on this channel. And Dan, Scott, Jerry, Howie, and Nick, thank you very much, guys. Uh, it's a good story. North Carolina Police Department ordered to pay man back after forfeiting seized money through controversial process. And this is from Fox 46 out of Charlotte. And we talked before about civil asset forfeiture. It's the kind of thing that's bothering more and more people, to put it lightly, to the point where I suspect that soon we're going to see it go away. But civil asset forfeiture is the idea that if the police encounter you, they encounter you, and you've got cash on you, for instance, they can go, where'd that cash come from? And if they don't believe you or if they just pretend they don't believe you, they can take the cash from you and force you to sue them to get it back. And the standard for winning that is actually kind of difficult and it costs money. So if you're going to spend money to get your money back, you see what the problem is. It's a math problem, among other things. So the idea of civil asset forfeiture has been riling more and more people lately. So a district court judge in North Carolina has given the town of Mooresville and its police department one week to comply with a court order or go to jail. The judge actually ordered them, give that man his money back, or I'm going to start jailing people. Very, very rarely do you ever hear this with respect to a municipality. Oftentimes, judges will threaten to jail people who are in front of them and say, if you don't do this, you can go to jail. But it's not often you hear them say regarding a city. Uh, if the city doesn't do something, someone's going to jail. So <clears throat> here's what happened. The Mooresville Police Department was called out to a hotel in November of 2020, and they searched an unoccupied rental car. Now, the question, of course, is did they have the right to search it and so on? We don't know. But while they were searching the car, they found a small amount of marijuana, as well as approximately $17,000 in cash belonging to a Connecticut man whose daughter resides in that county. So although he's not from the area, his daughter is. But he had $17,000 in cash on him. So on November 19th, the Mooresville Police Department was put on notice of a hearing to challenge the seizure of the money. And most states have a process where you can go and say, I, I, I want to challenge the forfeiture of the money. But the question is, is it worth pursuing? Now, $17,000 means if it costs you less than seventeen dollars to get your money back, then it's worth doing. But they often bank on the fact that they make it as convoluted and complicated as possible so that people will just say, ah, it's not worth it and go away from it. It varies from state to state and also depends on whether you're dealing with the state or the feds. And that's where this story gets weird. It gets weird. So the day before the hearing, the police sent a check for $17,000 to the federal government under the authority of the federal civil asset forfeiture law. And so... Of course, it looks like they did that on purpose. So the local police seized the money. They were going to keep it. When they get notified that, hey, someone's going to come after that money, they want their money back, the police department said, oh, okay, and they gave it to the feds. They're playing hot potato with it. And the weird part is that the federal government often seizes money also through their agents. It's not uncommon you hear about federal marshals uh, or, or other federal agents who come into contact with money and they seize it. And so here, the feds didn't seize the money. It was handed to them by the police who seized the money. And the attorney says that timing was not accidental. What they did was circumvent the system by giving it over to the federal government because they anticipated coming into court and being able to say, sorry, we don't have that money anymore. You're going to have to chase it down in the federal system. So the attorney went on to explain how difficult it is for people to get their money back after it is in the federal government's possession. So the consequence of that is people are forever without their money, even if ultimately their case is dismissed or they're found not guilty or otherwise their case goes away. The federal government can still keep that money. So the question you have is, this happened in North Carolina. The Mooresville Police Department finds $17,000 in someone's car. They take it. A court is going to hold a hearing on it, and so they very quickly give it to the federal government. Why is the Mooresville Police Department handing $17,000 that's not theirs to the federal government. That's a problem. So to get forfeited money back from the federal government is also a costly process, one that most average people cannot afford. The attorney considers these forfeiture actions highway robbery and feels that the judge deserves a medal of honor for her bravery threatening Mooresville officials with incarceration. 
Next Thursday is the deadline for the man to get his money back. So Fox 46 has reached out to the town of Mooresville and the police department and has gotten no comment. So in a nutshell, the man's money was seized. He hired a local attorney. The local attorney set it for a hearing. All the way it's supposed to happen. The police department, the day before the hearing, takes the money and gives it to the feds. So we don't have the money anymore. The judge says, I don't care that you haven't got the money anymore. you got to give this man his money back. And she gives him a drop dead date. And she goes, and if it's not back in his possession by that point in time, someone's going to jail. Now, of course, whether someone actually goes to jail, I, I don't know if I'd put money on that. Uh, it's good. This is calling attention to the problem. Um, and I'd like to see her throw someone in jail. Uh, but the interesting thing is, if you think about this from just a typical perspective, let's pretend we're acting just normally and rationally as opposed to the law of civil asset forfeiture. If you have some money, you have some money, and I walk up to you and I take the money away from you without your permission, that would probably be some form of theft or robbery, depends on exactly the circumstances, but it's wrong that I take your money without your permission, you want your money back. I go, I'm not going to give you your money back. We're in America, so you say, okay, I'll see you in court. So you go to court, you file the proper paperwork, you notify me of the hearing, and the day before the hearing, I take the money and I give it to somebody else. And then I walk into court and go, your honor, I haven't got the money anymore. I haven't got the money anymore. The judge goes, what happens to the money? I gave it to somebody else. Can you imagine if that defense actually worked? Because criminals could do that all day long. And people who are being sued could do that all day long. That man stole my car. Give him his car back. I haven't got it anymore. I gave it to somebody else. Um, so that concept cannot work. And one of the biggest problems that you have, and, and, and I've been fascinated by this, the 30 years I've been an attorney, the two years I was in law school, and the years I was preparing to go to law school, is how people's mindset gets affected by who the parties are. So in other words, if you hear that like a movie star has filed for this, it sounds different than if your next door neighbor filed for the exact same thing. And likewise, if it's the government filing an action, it sounds different than if I file the action. But if the action is a legal action, it shouldn't matter who the parties are. So if you're the judge down there in North Carolina and two parties come before you and one party says, they took my money, I want it back. You turn to the other party and go, where's their money? Don't have it anymore, Your Honor. We gave it away yesterday. Okay, that's a problem. Now, the fact that that's the police department for a city giving it to the federal government shouldn't make a difference because there's no law that says, oh, by the way, we can steal your money, but we'll be exonerated if we give it to the federal government. There's no, there's no law that says that. There's no law that says that. Now, there is a strange law that's you know, swept across the nation that says that law enforcement of the encounter, you can take your stuff. They can take your money through civil asset forfeiture. That is weird. And that, of course, is a scourge on our nation. It's something that I've been railing about for years. But the fact that there's a civil asset forfeiture at the heart of this mess doesn't excuse everything else these parties are doing. So when they have the money and to play hot potato with it, they give it to somebody else, uh, does that exonerate what they did in the first place? No, no. So uh, it would be very, very nice if the Mooresville Police Department or the city of Mooresville simply cut a check for $17,000 and handed it to this man, I doubt they'll do that. I'll doubt, I doubt they'll do that. The other thing I can tell you is that quite often in cases like this, they'll often approach the person who lost their money and say, hey, if you drop your loss, it will give you half your money back. So you can have $17,000 maybe a couple years from now, or you can have $8,500 today. What do you want? Or you can have what's behind door number two. Um, this is crazy. I know it's crazy. And the, the interesting thing is when I do videos about civil asset forfeiture, I have several reactions. A lot of people go, Steve, thank you. This is something we've been talking about. I'm glad you're keeping it on the radar. 
I also have people go, this is crazy. I've never heard of this before. And I always have at least one person who goes, this cannot be happening. What you're describing is impossible in America. It would be unconstitutional. It'd be a violation of the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, blah, blah, blah. It would be, but the Supreme Court has upheld it. And by the way, I'm just going to say this now. Everyone loves to blame this on the people they don't like. So I'm going to get people in the comments going, this is all this person's fault. It's all this person's fault. It's all this person's fault. And they're be naming people from the 20th century. Civil asset forfeiture goes back a long time. It actually predates the United States of America as a country. So how widespread it's been, how active it's been, how common it's been, that's changed over time. But a lot of the reason it's changed over time is that we're more aware of it because of modern media. Okay, someone gets their money seized in North Carolina at a motel, and uh, a couple weeks later, we're hearing about it. That wouldn't have happened in the 1800s. Okay, so that's probably what's going on more than anything else. So North Carolina Police Department ordered to pay money back uh, that they seized as forfeited through a controversial process. And if they don't, the judge says people might be going to jail, which would be nice. Dan, Scott, Jerry, Howie, Nick, thanks for sending it. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Stealing someone's coffee is called mugging.